All right. Um, I'm so excited to do this. Um, I get to um, introduce my very good friend and colleague, Dr. Courtney Cogburn. Uh, Dr. Cogburn is an associate professor at the Columbia School of Social Work and a faculty affiliate of the Columbia Population Research Center. She's also the co-director of the Justice, Equity, and Technology Lab at Columbia Social Work. Uh, her research integrates principles and methodologies across psychology, stress physiology, and social epidemiology to investigate relationships between racism-related stress and racial health disparities across the life course. Her work has been supported by the National Institutes of Health and the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Her current research projects examine the effects of cultural racism in the media on physiological, psychological, and behavioral stress reactivity and moderating effects of cognitive appraisal processes, the role of structural racism in producing disease risk, and chronic psychosocial stress exposure and related implications for understanding black-white disparities in cardiovascular health and disease between early and late adulthood. <clears throat> At the end of 2014, Dr. Cogburn received an award for a project titled Black Face to Ferguson, a mixed methodological examination of media racism, media activism, and health. What's missing from her bio is that she is a two-time participant of the Tribeca Film Festival, and she makes the best, best, best catfish this side of the Mississippi. So without further ado, Dr. Cogburn. Thank you, Desmond, and thank you, everyone. Um, I am happy to be here, and um, that's uh, I say that in earnest. Um, I have been meeting with your team uh, behind the scenes uh, in terms of planning and thinking about this event, um, and they have been so thoughtful. Uh, I'm excited about the workshops and the plan they have to engage around these important um, themes and, and topics. Um, so I'm happy to, to try and contribute to your thinking as you go into uh, your workshops. So my focus is on helping people to better understand racism. And I have a photo here of my grandmother and myself playing goldfish, I imagine. Um, and she would say, you can't fix a problem you don't understand. Um, and so uh, what I find is that a lot of people don't actually understand what racism is and how it functions, and that uh, becomes a barrier to effective engagement. Um, so as we jump into this, as we're thinking about ways to understand, let me give you some food for thought. So these are questions, prompts I just want you to think about as I move through my talk today. First, I'd like you to consider the distinction between identity versus positionality. So when we talk about identity, we're really thinking about your personal perceptions and definitions of yourself. That might be based on race or gender or your bowling hobbies, whatever it is, you have a series of things that make up how you see um, and feel about yourself. Positionality, however, is more so about how we walk through the world, how other people see us, how they engage with us as a result of what they perceive about us. For some people, there's a misalignment between how they define themselves in terms of their identity and how they're perceived by others. So I'd love you to consider whether there's a distinction between the two for you um, and why it might be important to um, make this distinction. Second, I'd like you to consider your proximity to whiteness. So if we're thinking about whiteness and blackness on a spectrum, um, I'm not only focused on a dichotomy here, there's a lot that's that's complex about race, but let's, let's uh, simplify it to whiteness and blackness. Where would you draw a line on this scale? There's no value difference, uh, at least uh, in absolute terms, there are in terms of our social cultural practices, but where would you place yourself in terms of your positionality, not your identity? So you walk through the world, people see you and perceive you in a particular way, where would you place yourself on this line? This might change depending on the room you're standing in, uh, whether you're with your family or whether you're at work, but let's sort of take an average in terms of where you would fall on this line, okay? I'd also like you to consider that if good intentions are insufficient, what personal, what, what uh, personal and professional work do you have to do to meaningfully engage racism and anti-racism across your spheres of influence? So assuming that good intentions, your willingness to do the right thing is insufficient, what else do you need to do and work on in order to meaningfully engage in this work? Okay. 
So I'd like to break my talk today um, in about the 30 minutes or so that I have remaining with you into three different buckets. One is the bucket of racism. What is it? How does it function in relation to mental health and generally anti-racism? What is that? And how should we be framing and thinking about that in relation to our work? And also to share some of my work that, that Desmond mentioned um, that links technology and uh, racism, in particular anti-racist practices. So let's deal with the racism bucket. When we think about white supremacy, people often picture KKK hoods or perhaps white polo shirts and tiki torches marching in my, at my alma mater in Charlottesville, Virginia, um, as a representation of white supremacy, the proud boys, if you will, um, touting the superiority of whiteness. Most people, frankly, would reject that notion. They wouldn't consciously state that they believe white people are superior to other groups of people. White, super white supremacy, however, is much more nuanced and complex and insidious than people marching in the street uh, claiming white supremacy. White supremacy is embedded in the fabric of our organizations. Whiteness and white people have often been treated as the default for which we assess and determine everything our norms, our practices, the way we've organized structures, our assumptions about intelligence, uh, the types of knowledge and ways of interacting that we value, all are shaped by whiteness. It's often invisible though to white people. It's not invisible to people who have a farther distance from that scale of whiteness and blackness because their ability to navigate white spaces requires that they understand whiteness. So I want us to hold that white supremacy is essentially embedded throughout our socio-political landscape. One example is the way in, ways in which it shows up in language. So encoding with the word master, uh, the use of the word minority to describe large groups of people who actually make up the numerical majority, underrepresented in the assumptions that we make about that term. I'd like to break some of those down. So one, going back to the scale on whiteness and blackness, the people who fall on the blackness side of this scale actually make up the global majority. We often use the language, however, a minority to refer to them. We use the language minority, again, even when they make up most of the people in the room. So minority becomes this sort of reductive uh, language of reducing the significance of a group of people, even if that wasn't the intention, and can be used in a way that's numerically inaccurate. So it's important for us to consider why am I using particular terms and phrases and how might that be laced with whiteness? Underrepresented. In, in addition to sort of describing why groups are underrepresented in a particular space, it's also important for us to interrogate why. Are we presuming something that's inherent to whiteness or blackness that equates representation? Are white people more likely to be in a particular role because they're better? Or if they are more prepared or better educated, why might those things be true? Are they actually better? Are there barriers in the way of different groups in, um, integrating into particular spaces? So interrogating um, our rationale for the use of language and not just sort of conveniently using symbols and words, but interrogating um, the, the realities underlying that language. So when thinking about health, why does race then matter for health? So checking a box black doesn't equal disease. I like to use this example from one of my mentors who actually recently passed away. But he would say, if it's just a matter of checking a box black, then we can all start checking a different box and all those problems would go away. I'd never want to check a different box. I quite in box. I quite enjoy being black. But it's not a matter of the box. It what it's what comes along with the box. It's what comes along with the box in terms of identity, and it what what comes along with the box in terms of positionality. Even more importantly, so regardless of how you identify, are you having a lived experience shaped by the box you check, or the position you hold, regardless of the box you check? So why does race matter for health? because of racism. That's the short answer. So let's break that down a little bit. So if we don't interrogate the source of categorical racial differences, we're essentially left with what some people call a bio-racist frame. Simply saying black people look like this and white people look like that and that's the end of the story is racist. We have to again interrogate the why. Why are we observing these differences? What systems and structures are contributing to what we're observing? Racism is also a fundamental cause of health inequality. And let me explain this a bit. So one, especially when we think about the legacy of mental health and mental illness in this country, 
Racist systems have contributed to the ways in which we practice and research mental health. Much of what we understand about psychology, for instance, is based on white male college samples. A predominant proportion of this research, except for the research that's been developed over the past, say, 30 years, has predominantly focused on white samples. So what we assume about self-esteem or depression and depressive symptoms, et cetera, are largely based on white samples. It's also true that the measures that we've developed are then based on white samples. So we think that depression looks like this. So we'll measure it this way. And this then contributes to misdiagnosis, underdiagnosis, and overdiagnosis in all other groups because it wasn't based on their experiences and, and manifestations of, say, depression and other forms of mental illness. We also think about racism as being a fundamental cause. And when I say fundamental cause, I mean a root cause. So it is a factor that's contributing to almost everything else that we're trying to understand and interrogate and intervene upon. So we also frame racism as being a fundamental cause because it also contributes to socioeconomic factors. So we know the significance of education and income and health insurance and access to quality health care, et cetera. Those things and whether there are differences across racial groups are also grounded in structural racism. Differences that have been historically met, um, unfolding and also manifesting in a contemporary form as well. So there are also ways in which racism has direct implications for health, um, that it has direct pathways to acute and chronic stress. So experiences with racism, exposure to racism in different forms over and over and over again, eventually start to tax our physiological and psychological systems that end up leading to disease in ways that, again, can be directly tied to racism in its various forms. So another quick note about language as it relates to mental health. So mental health racial disparities, when we use the language of disparities, we're really focused on difference. So we're thinking about differences in mental health indices, prevalence, access, and quality of care that persist even after we account for other known correlates um, that shape mental health. When we use the language of inequities, however, we're not only thinking about difference, we are implying in our use of language that those differences are tied to structural injustice, but those differences are tied to things that we could actually do something about. There's nothing inherent about a particular group of people that means that they have a particular representation of depression rates in their community. We can usually tie that to some contextual factor, some shared contextual experience or shared uh, structural systems that contribute to those patterns that we're observing. So the language of inequity implies injustice. Disparities mostly implies just difference. So we're thinking about social determinants of health, and I won't spend a lot of time here. Um, Dr. Hairston is going to cover a lot of this ground um, in her talk. But when we're thinking about social determinants of health. We're thinking of upstream factors as what well, things like chronic stress, uh, prenatal and early life experiences, intergenerational transfer, experiences with racism. When we're thinking about downstream factors, we're thinking about knowledge and education, actual behaviors that contribute to the outcomes that we're observing, primary care in terms of access and quality. But what's important to think, um, to frame in terms of all of these is the argument I'm making, is that because racism is a fundamental cause, it shapes all social determinants of mental health. And that these things accumulate both in terms of advantage and disadvantage over time. So ultimately, Understanding racial inequities in health requires that we understand racism and understand that racism is a form of structural injustice, that it's not just a matter of calling someone a name or the one time someone had an experience with the discrimination. We're talking about systems, patterns over time across domains of society that intersect and accumulate to create risk and threat in life. So moving to anti-racism. I like to say, I don't need you to like me, I need you to hate racism. So too often we think about racism as our relationships. Do we like each other? Can we hold hands? Can we grab a beer? Can we, uh, do our kids play soccer together, etc.? Racism will not be resolved. Those systems, racism as a fundamental call, these cause, these social determinants of health will not be resolved by our relationship. It will not be resolved by us liking each other. And so we need to frame and understand racism in this way so that we can all move forward in actually making progress in uh, doing something about these systems and not only thinking about it in terms of our relationships. So what is anti-racism? 
I would frame anti-racism as an assumption that racism and white supremacy are embedded throughout systems, across domains, and can only be addressed through conscious and active engagement and becoming the default for intention setting, analysis, and action. So this says, um, uh, sorry to go back. So this is saying that, what, again, that white supremacy is embedded in everything and that we have to engage in conscious action to avoid racism to avoid racist action and racist outcomes. When we think about anti-Black racism in particular, and I invite you to stay present in the focus on Black communities today. This doesn't suggest that other communities, other racial groups are not worthy of having conversation um, and talking about these issues. And I assure you this form of oppression is not a race that anyone wants to win, but there is some significance to talking about anti-Blackness and anti-Black racism in particular. So when I talk about anti-blackness, think about that spectrum of whiteness to blackness that I that I referenced earlier. So this can refer to, to a broadly reference the oppression and systemic disadvantaging of people of black African descent, people who would check the box black, presumably. But it also refers to others who are proximal to blackness and more distant from whiteness. So consider, for instance, the oppression of people with darker skin tones global, globally, India, Brazil, as well as various cultural values around the world that express aversions to being associated with blackness or darker skin. So there's something specific about black and who would check that box and the experiences that come along with that. And then there are associations with blackness, the darker skinned phenotypes, et cetera, around the world and the consistent patterns that we see around anti-black racism in particular. So here are seven notes, keeping that in mind, here are seven notes that I'd like to offer about anti-racism. So one, given that white supremacy is embedded in everything and that anti-racism requires conscious action to undo and overcome that injustice, if it's not anti-racist, it's racist. If you haven't deliberately considered how you're going to avoid racial harm, if you haven't deliberately considered how you're going to try and promote racial justice in whatever action it is that you're engaged in, it doesn't matter if you're an AI, direct practice in terms of mental health care, if you haven't actively considered this, the odds are that you are going to engage in a way that produces a pattern of racism. Diversity does not equal anti-racism. So a mixture of people from different groups in a room says nothing about equity, says nothing about inclusion, and says nothing about the engagement of policies that again, undo harm and avoid harm on the basis of race. Also, shifting you away from a tendency to think, but I'm not racist. There's this tendency to want to invest in, how do you see me? As long as you don't see me as racist, it's all good. Phew. If I were handing out not racist stickers, many people would take it and wear it proudly. And I would then give you that sticker and say, that's not actually the point. Whether you're racist or not, again, does nothing for these systems that have historically created systemic disadvantage on the basis of race. It's also not the same thing as being anti-racist. So I would argue your emphasis on whether you're racist or not, or whether you're biased or not, while it is a meaningful personal process, it is also narcissistic if you rest there. Lowercase n, I know we're in a, a mental health setting here. So what I ask people to focus on is anti-racism, shifts in behavior, engagement, and shifts in policy that are intending, again, to avoid racial harm and undo the effects of past racial harms. It's also important for us in anti-racist work to move beyond individual bias. So we use the language of bias. We're often referring to unconscious bias. We all have a little bit of bias, so it all kind of washes out. We're all in the same position. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about, and I believe the framing of this session is societal bias. We're thinking about systems again. We're thinking about the ways in which these choices and decisions accumulate to produce widespread disadvantage across domains of life. So again, asking us in anti-racist work to focus on systems, patterns, and structures. Also, that colorblindness is not a solution to racism, it's a form of racism. So there are only certain groups of people who have the privilege of ignoring the significance of race in their lives and in other people's lives. Everyone else is fighting a, a struggle based on race every day. And your ignoring that or feigned ignorance around that is offensive and harmful. Um, and in fact, many, myself and others would argue, is a form of racism in and of itself. 
anti-racism is not a badge. You don't get a sticker. You don't get to put it on your social media profile claiming that you have somehow arrived at some anti-racist destination. I would think about anti-racism more to the ways in which I think of happiness. It's not a destination, it's a journey. It's a way we approach the engagement of our work and our lives. It's an orientation. Number seven, there's also a tendency in this work to want to fix problems. But I think we're also in a moment where we're imagining the possibility of transformation. We're imagining the possibilities of actually being who we'd like to think we are. Um, actually being a generous, free living space for all people. So that work requires not just fixing problems and undoing harm, that requires creating pathways to justice, creating pathways to freedom, creating pathways to opportunity and options. That requires that we reimagine futures. So lastly, I'd like to talk through some of my work in um, emerging technology and thinking about Okay, we're thinking about anti-racism. We're thinking about um, the ways in which this manifests across multiple systems. I'm making an argument that understanding this is critical and important. So I asked myself, Courtney, what do you do about this? How do you engage and help people to better understand what racism is? Again, so that we can all collectively get on the same page, so that we can collectively move beyond symbolic investment and start to do the real hard, complex work of anti-racism. So I, with a team at Stanford, created a piece called A Thousand Cut Journey. And in this work, I really wanted to think about ways to build racial competence by creating a piece on uh, racism that was focused on racism. And the underlying premise of this, and I, I came up with this framing um, at the outset of the project before we created anything, I sort of started to frame this idea that achieving racial justice requires that we understand racism and not an understanding that emerges from intellectual exercise or even in the consumption or production of science, but rather a visceral understanding that connects the spirit and body as much as reason. So I'm a social scientist, I'm a psychologist and social worker and public health scholar. I, I use data and numbers and empirical approaches to understand these things and engage these things all the time. My work in virtual reality is also empirically grounded and we're, we've run a number of studies assessing the effects of this particular piece, which I'll describe in a, mo in a moment. But the point here is what I'm saying is that it's not just about the data because people have described this perhaps to you before. You've read articles, you've read books, you've been paying attention to the world around you. And there's still this sense of resistance to the reality of racism, the depths and insidiousness of racism in our lives. So data may not be sufficient intellectual pontificating about the realities of racism and reading all the best books may not be sufficient. What if we need something else? And so from my perspective, I thought, how can I create a gut punch to help people wake up to the realities of racism? Whether we're successful or not is to be determined. I also decided at the outset of this work that I was targeting a very particular group of people, you might guess based on the image here. So I was very clear that I was targeting a white liberal audience. And when I would say that, I'd often get pushback where people would say, aren't you preaching to the choir and shouldn't you be talking to the proud boys, the far, you know, the far right? And I said, yes, I'm preaching to the choir. And in fact, I'm gonna put a picture of an all white choir in my talks to make that crystal clear because this, work, this group has a lot of work to do. This is a group. But this again, this is empirically based. This is a group that espouses beliefs of equity and justice, particularly in terms of race and in general. This is also a group that overestimates how much racial progress we've actually made. This is also a group that overly invests in the symbolism of being a liberal person, being a good person, and under invests in action and engagement in their day to day lives and again across their spheres of influence. This group says they're on board. This group says that they get it. And then consistently, we see failures to actually act and move us toward racial progress. So yes, this is the group that I'm talking to and engaging. It's also grounded again in this notion that white people don't understand racism. So I'll pause here and say, I know that white people are often not used to being grouped and framed in conversations about racism. This is becoming more common now. 
So acknowledge that discomfort and let's move on because we can't talk about racism and we can't talk about anti-racism without acknowledging and talking about whiteness and without holding whiteness accountable for everything I've been talking about today. Whiteness, white people, they're not necessarily the same thing. That's a longer conversation, but stay with me. So white people don't understand racism. And I have an asterisk here that's quite big. Don't listen, willfully ignore, opt out of acknowledging, actively dismiss, reduce to a problem of the past, believe it's an exaggeration, don't want to feel uncomfortable, relinquish privilege, power, or status. So there's a knowing in this that you may see it, you may march, you may rally, you may have conversations with your family, but do you really understand this? And I'm not talking about empathy. I have issues with empathy and I know I'm working in VR and VR is often touted as the ultimate empathy machine. I'm talking about, do you engage in complex and sophisticated social analysis of what racism is and how it functions? Not only how it has harmed other groups of people, but how it has systematically created advantage and benefit for you. We don't live in a meritocracy that meritocracy and failures of meritocracy are actually grounded in race and whiteness in various ways. So do we understand that? Do we understand how that has actually shown up in our personal lives? Do we understand how that's shown up in our prof professional spheres as well? So I pulled together a team. I had these ideas. I had a target audience. I had a broad framework for what it was that I wanted to achieve in the virtual reality work. And I pulled together a transdisciplinary team. And what I mean by that is that I pulled together people from across disciplines, both academic, uh, across areas of life in terms of personal background and lived experience and sources of knowledge um, to create this piece. The idea here was that I needed this team to come together to integrate these areas of expertise. I didn't want to create an idea and just go consult a computer scientist and, or a programmer of some sort and like, how do I actually make this? How do I achieve this? I need the programmer and computer scientist at the table with me, understanding what racism is, how it feels, what it looks like, so that we can create and imagine together. And that was the process. That's a transdisciplinary process. That's the process that we engaged for this work. So I worked on this with a team here at Columbia, as well as a team at Stanford University the, in the Virtual Human Interaction Lab with Jeremy Balenson. And I approached Jeremy um, at the outset. So I should say one, I had never used virtual reality at the time that I uh, started to develop this project and write the proposal for this project. I literally never had a headset on um, and had some vague sense of what virtual reality was. But I reached out to Jeremy and I said, you don't know me, but might you be interested in doing a project on racism? Here are some of my thoughts and ideas about how we could do this. He responded almost right away. So I was shocked. Um, I also didn't understand exactly who he was in the space until much later. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm even more shocked now that he responded. And he said, sure. And we had a conversation. We started to build this synergy around this project. So you have this white guy who um, has mostly focused on uh, climate and gender and homelessness and some other issues, broadly thinking about social and behavioral applications of VR. And you have me, who's deeply steeped in racism and white supremacy and all those sorts of things, knows nothing about the tech. But in a transdisciplinary approach, we come together to create this piece. And what we created was a piece that puts you into the digital shoes of a black male as a child, adolescent, and as an adult. And we named this character Michael Sterling. So I was just recalling yesterday in a talk that I gave that um, in an early interview about this piece, and, and I, I tell you the story to give you a sense of the insidiousness of these experiences um, and how it can affect the body and mental health. But a journalist was asking me, we hadn't even created the full piece yet. We had started um, production. But the journalist asked me, okay, so Michael Sterling, you, you based that name on Michael Brown and Alton Sterling, right? And I had to catch my breath for a moment because that's not what I had done. I just thought I pulled the name from the air. Okay, I was rushing Michael Sterling, let's move on with that. But my subconscious had been colored by the lives and deaths of these two men and many, many others in a way that it was shaping my decision making outside of my consciousness in a way that I wasn't even fully aware of. And it really sort of took my breath away again to kind of come to that realization in that moment. So I feel connected to 
um, certainly as a black woman, but but lived experiences around race and racism generally, both for myself and the team helped color the experience that we created. So in the first scene of this experience, you're a young version of Michael. Um, it's a digital immersive experience where you have control over the body. You're able to um, interact with, say, the blocks here that are in front of you. You can grab and throw those. Um, the kids in front of you, uh, pictured in the screenshot here, are taunting you and saying, Michael, throw the fireball, throw the scary black fireball. Black is always the scariest. So we're introducing ways in which even young children start to pick up language that is racialized and racist, um, even if they are unaware of what it is that they're saying or the effects of what it is that they're saying. Our children are not colorblind. Our world is not colorblind. They're getting the messages about these things, whether we explicitly tell them or not. So we encourage you to stack and throw these blocks, and most people actually end up throwing the block toward the kid on my right who says, black is always the scariest, throw the scary black fireball. When you do that, it triggers a white female teacher who's off to the side here saying, Michael, you're gonna, you're being dangerous. You're gonna hurt someone, even though the other kids have also been throwing the blocks. So in this scene, we've done a couple of things. We've made you feel distant from the other children. We've made you feel isolated. You're being chastised for engaging in a behavior while the other children engaged in the same behavior are not chastised. A kid who's actually using very harmful racial language is not being identified as problematic at all on the scene. You are the problem engaging in this particular behavior. And this is not just an interesting story. This is based in an empirical literature where we document disciplinary practices in the classroom and how early in life this starts. So when you start to think about the effects of racism on health, the effects of racism on mental health, racism as a source of stress and trauma, we want people to realize that it starts very early in life. Um, and it's something that's carried with you across time and context. In the second scene, we use mirrors a lot throughout. In the second scene, you see yourself in a mirror. You can wave, move the hand around, again, connecting with a slightly older version of yourself as a teenager. You're able to walk around your bedroom. In the experience, you can throw the basketball around. You see a breaking news alert that pops up on the screen that says a unarmed black teen has been killed by a white police officer. So again, we're trying to layer in experiences. What, is, what does an exposure to racism actually mean? It means that it's not just things that are happening directly to you, it's the things that are around you. I study specifically cultural racism, the ways in which our language and symbols and media have manifestations of white supremacy and racism. So even this news alert is yet another exposure to the realities of racism in your life. You then go downstairs, you get a call from your friend Adam, who's white. He's waiting for you to go to the basketball game. You're heading out, your mom sitting on the couch watching the news in the living room and says, Michael, you need to change. The police are looking for someone who's dressed like you. So a mother is having to worry about what shirt you're wearing, fearing for your life potentially. Your friend Adam doesn't understand. He says, don't worry about it. We're, we're running late for the game. Your mother then says, don't forget what happened to your brother. You change, you put on your um, hoodie, you walk outside, you're talking to neighbors who are wishing you good luck on a game, to the game, on the game that you're headed to, and all of a sudden a police car pulls up and three officers jump out and start yelling at you. Get on the fucking ground, cursing, yelling, and become more aggressive if you make eye contact or don't follow their instructions. They never touch you, they never physically harm you, but in this moment of innocence walking down the street headed to your basketball game, you're suddenly exposed to this threat. We have you, the user, get down on your knees and put your hands up while the officers continue to yell realize they have the wrong person, they tell you to get up, no apology, and walk away. There's a moment when the police are yelling at you and you're on your knees and you have your hands up. There's a moment where the lights go dark, everything's dark, the chaos in the neighborhood, leave that boy alone, um, the, the officer's yelling at you. There's a moment where all of that goes quiet and you hear your mother's voice say, just do what you have to do to get home alive. Again, it's not just the immediate threat. It's that a mother had to tell you this in the first place and that it wasn't paranoia, that it's actually a real threat in your life. Again, we didn't make this up for the sake of drama. We pulled from stop and frisk data in New York City, how often they happen and what neighborhoods do they happen in video footage of officers stopping people, individuals filming with cameras, and we recreated that. We want you to experience that. We want you to feel that. When we premiered this work at the Tribeca Film Festival, I didn't realize what it would feel like for Black people to watch white people experiencing racism. 
I didn't realize, and I still don't quite have the words to describe it, what it feels like for a black person to watch a white person down on their knees with their hands up, visualizing what they may be hearing or seeing. It's quite traumatic, I think, even seeing that, because it's such a reminder of how distant and foreign that experience is for the person um, in the headset, potentially. But what does it mean for the person in the headset? What are you learning and understanding now that you're physically embodying this sense of shame, embarrassment, fear for your life, even though no one's touching you, even though you've done nothing wrong? In the third scene, you transition to an older version of yourself where you're in a workplace setting. And in this scene, we were aiming to um, create an experience of feeling dismissed, um, ignored, undervalued, and invisible in some ways, which are difficult to describe to people. It's difficult to describe that a receptionist was dismissive of you. And if you've never experienced that, it's hard to describe to you how that feels. So we wanted to create that in virtual reality. So in this scene, you hand in your resume, you can see that you um, have attended Yale and you can read other information about your um, educational and professional background. You approach the waiting area, the white gentleman on the left up to my left um, is another candidate waiting for the job. He kind of blackens the way he's talking to you as if he's sort of cool. Um, and then the interviewer walks up and immediately approaches, approaches the white candidate and says, you must be our candidate from Yale. We're so excited to meet you. The white candidate has now shifted the way that he's speaking. He's more white in the way that he's presenting his cadence and voice and language. And he says, no, sir, I'm a proud graduate of Michigan State. I went to the University of Michigan, so I put Michigan State in here as a dig. At this point, the interviewer hasn't acknowledged your presence at all. He's looked directly at this candidate and is corrected by the receptionist who says, Michael is actually our candidate from Yale, the candidate he was clearly most excited to meet. And the screenshot here is the moment when the interviewer first turns to you and acknowledges your presence at all and says, hi, Michael, I didn't see you there. You don't mind if I take him back first, do you? You later get a phone call saying that you're a great candidate for the position, but you just aren't a good cultural fit for the organization. Again, this is not an exaggeration. We're not making this up, right? We're using empirical data as well as stories that have been shared with us about people living these experiences every day. So I'm broadly interested and engaged in this idea of racism and representing racism and the traumas and stress associated with racism. And I'm asking you to consider, although you're not able to put the headset on and go through this experience, I'm asking you to consider, is this much bigger? Is this much more subtle? Is it invisible to you in some ways that have sort of operated outside of your uh, um, assessment of day-to-day -day life? It has it operated outside of your lived experience in a way that prevents you from being anti-racist. You can't solve a problem you can't see, and you can't solve a problem you don't understand. So have you really be, been seeing this? Have you really been paying attention to this? Not just police violence, in all the ways that I'm describing. And this is the surface of what's actually happening in day-to-day -day life for Black people living in the United States in particular. Have you been missing it? And not only have you been missing it, have you been experiencing the absence of this? Has the absence of this in your life helped shape who you are in your opportunities? Not having to deal with this, not having to have a mother worry about what color shirt you're wearing and in fear that that might have some effect on your actual life. So think about all aspects of this when you consider engaging in this work. The last thing I'll share before I close is that we're continuing to develop this work. We've run several studies using our virtual, the, the Thousand Cut Journey at this point, and we've been trying to get a sense of not only does it have an effect on empathy, which is actually less interesting for me, but I'm interested in analysis. Do people engage the problem of racism differently, and are they translating it to other contexts beyond the VR? So we're running several studies to try and help us get a sense of that. We're also post-production um, on our new piece. Um, uh, the picture here is in a motion capture studio with our, with our actors um, at the wrap of our shoot. Um, but we're also kind of exploring ways, how do we keep pushing this narrative? How do we keep pushing the use of this technology to better understand um, how we might engage these issues? We're also playing around with data visualization. And I share this so that you get a sense of uh, the, the various ways in which I'm trying to approach using these technologies to engage the problem of racism and to engage a practice of anti-racism. 
So one of the things we're considering with data visualization is using a zip code as almost a prison bar on various digital bodies standing in a space. And you can walk up and touch the zip code and immediately get information about that person's life trajectory. We know a lot about uh, your life expectancy predicted solely on the basis of your zip code, which is more reliable than your genetic makeup. That's absurd that that should be true. And we want people to understand that. So how can we use data visualization in VR to help you do that? We're also playing around with the ability to manipulate time in VR. So can you return to a scene, your Brooklyn neighborhood in New York, and drag time forwards or backwards and see the physical environment change or see the bodies on the street change as a result of a policy decision that's been made? We have a lot of data, again, about stop and frisk practices in New York City. As you drag time forwards from the point that stop and frisk gets introduced as a formal policy, how does the physical environment change? How do the bodies on the street who we know are most likely to be stopped by the police, how do those bodies change? For instance, as time increases, those bodies might slowly start to lose color saturation and become more translucent and eventually becoming outlines representing incarceration rates, as opposed to the white bodies standing around them in the same space. So we're really trying to push the boundaries to innovate in what we're trying to achieve here. So in closing, what I want to emphasize again is that we cannot achieve racial justice without understanding racism. How does it actually work? How has it always worked in our society? And start to undo those building blocks in every sphere of influence that we have. That's what it means to be anti-racist. Thank you, and I look forward to our discussion. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Cogburn. Um, as a member of that white liberal choir, I got to really thank you for uh, all the comments today and, and the, the, the work you've done in VR is really powerful. Um, hearing that, I, I really look forward to um, <laughs> experiencing that. Um, and I, th I really like what you said that we, we don't just fix problems, we've got to reimagine futures. And so I'm wondering if um, we could start there especially with what we're talking about today, how would you reimagine the future of mental health research um, based on, you know, on how, how would it look for mental health research and that development to be anti-racist? Yeah, I think, you know, such a critical, and I'm interested in other people's thoughts about this as well. I think a critical piece is to understand, <laughs> understand, uh, what has created what creates mental health and what creates mental illness and the, the different things that contribute to um, the manifestation of illness versus health. Um, and there's so much of this. I know Danielle's going to touch on some of this. Um, excuse me, Dr. Harrison is going to touch on some of this later as well. Um, but we really have to understand the ways in which every system we have around mental health has been fundamentally grounded in white supremacy and structural racism. So the way that we define and diagnose depression, the way that we define and diagnose schizophrenia, um, it doesn't just so happen that certain groups have a higher prevalence of certain um, illnesses. I think it's also important in this landscape to understand that because in general, black people actually have a lower prevalence of certain mental illnesses. But when they do have those illnesses, they're more chronic, they're more severe, they're less likely to get adequate care, and they're most like they're more likely to be um, misdiagnosed or underdiagnosed as a result of that. And so it's not just a matter of prevalence, who has more of something, but how is that disease or illness actually manifesting? And what are the roots of that disease or illness? And the absence of illness is not health. And so really thinking carefully about the relationship between mental illness and mental health. Yeah. I also just want to, I know we've got a couple questions from the audience. I want to encourage people to use the Q&A in the live event to ask questions. Um, and before we go there, Desmond, do you want to ask any questions? Yeah, absolutely. Courtney, thank you so much for that riveting uh, discussion. Um, I'm interested to hear your thoughts around your own intersectional identities and how it informed the design choices that you made in your VR experience. Um, and why might that be important for the moment that we're living in right now? You know, it's interesting. So people often ask me, why did you talk about a black man? Why did you center a black male experience? That's not what you're asking me, but why did I center a black male experience versus a black um, 
woman experience. Um, and to your point about intersectionality, it's because that was, I think, the idea that was really difficult for me to grapple with, to introduce myself into an experience that I have to talk about over and over and over again, and to have centered the complexities of my being a Black woman in that I needed a little bit of distance, actually, I think, um, from it. Um, so I think maybe not in what you were asking, but it has, it, it shaped it in that I decided to remove it from um, what I, what I integrated into the design. And that was, I think, in service, not consciously, this is really upon reflection. I think that was in service of protecting my own mental health, right? So another thing that we have to think about is what it means to engage in this work, not only in terms of a lived experience, but from a professional point of view, how many times do I have to talk about this VR and racism? And if I were personally grounding myself in all of it, that would be quite traumatic for me. Um, so I deliberately dealt with the intersection of maleness and blackness, but deliberately opted not to include myself in the experience. Excellent, I'll share one of the questions we've gotten from an attendee. Uh, they write, I'm wondering what Dr. Cogburn's thoughts are about reimagining future of mental health treatment that considers and accurately treats the mental health needs of Black people when much of the current treatment and the diagnostic tools are based on white people. So, so one, going back to the point that you have to interrogate, what are we assuming is just sort of a norm that's actually grounded in white norms and whiteness? So that one has to be unpacked and interrogated. And two, you start to see this landscape shift when you have Black mental health practitioners in this space, right? The questions we ask, the resources and coping and resilience that we look to, the way that we frame and understand Black life and experiences is really different. And so I've seen the landscape shift the more that we have Black psychiatrists and psychologists um, and clinicians of various social workers working in the space. So the way that a Black woman, the Black women I work with, the way that they pr approach clinical care is really different. It's fundamentally different even than the way we train them in school, right? What they bring into that space, the types of interventions that they create are really different. So you have to change the people and support, um, uplift the voices that are already in the space um, to help them do the work that they're already doing and then start to make that mainstream, right? So when we start to center people who are marginalized and oppressed, we actually often lift up everyone's boat. And so we need to think that, uh, take that approach when we're thinking about mental health, um, as well. Um, for instance, I'll give you one example. I have a group of Black female colleagues who recently um, received a grant to study the ways in which Black women are using social media spaces for mental health care um, during, in the age of COVID. So how does uh, DJ D Nice and Versus Battles on um, Twitter and Instagram actually promote mental health, right? You would never hear that framed that way in a in a traditional mental health set setting because we're centering whiteness. We're not centering what people are actually doing in other ways that they're engaging in other parts of their lives. So completely shifting the focus and the scope with which we're, we're framing and thinking about these things and assuming at the outset that the way I've been trained to think about this is probably rooted in whiteness. Yeah. Just a, quick, just a quick question for Courtney, though, because I think that point is such an important one. I'm also thinking about what does it then mean to evaluate proposals in the way in which you just described? So because a lot of us, our training doesn't allow for us to evaluate a proposal in a way that would make that proposal successful. So what might be needed? Yeah, I wrote a piece about this in, um, for the Social Science Research Council, particularly around like how we are evaluating work um, uh, in, in crisis situations and what types of work do we value. But this is a broader issue in terms of how we issue funding. And again, sort of speaks to the, the need of an anti-racist frame. Who you are is shaping what you see and what you value. How you've been trained has been actually a limited and narrow uh, field of view of what's important and what's what's needed. And so the easiest thing to do, rather than trying to undo all your biases um, and frames of thinking, is to change who's sitting at the table and who has power to evaluate the proposals in the first place. Who did you even consult to write the call? for the proposal? What networks were you relying on to distribute the call for the proposal? Um, so these are ways in which racist practices actually perpetuate. I'm gonna send it out to everyone I know. Everyone you know is mostly white. They don't know the black practitioners who are doing cool, innovative work in the space, and they're never gonna see your call or your proposal. And they may not respond because of the way that you framed it, or they may submit a proposal 
that says, I think social media and Twitter and Instagram are important for mental health. And you'll dismiss that because that's not your lived experience. So it it matters who's at the table at the outset to to help us sort of engage and do this in a meaningful way. Yeah, unless we have a workshop. (laughs) 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 So, yes, thank you. so we're getting a bunch more questions in here, which is great. We also have one that's a statement, not a question that I just want to share. Uh, Dr. Cogburn is all the things, goat goals with heart. So just sharing that with you. That's awesome. I needed that. Thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Uh, now, now back to the questions. Um, many corporations and systems are engaging in performative justice around inter- interrupting racism, et cetera. How do we get true buy-in from white-centered spaces when the system was made for whiteness? Again, people need to understand what racism is and they don't. So if you, if you understood what racism is, you would know that your Black History Month program is not gonna do anything uh, to fix racism. Um, another piece in the way that I frame this again is that you have to hold whiteness accountable. We like to have nice conversations about racism and bias and ways in which we can all still feel pretty good when we walk out of the room. At least the white people feel pretty good. The black people often leave thinking, here we go again with this nonsense, right? And so what we really have to think about is can we acknowledge what racism is? Can we acknowledge how it exists in this structure, in this system, in this organization, not out there, not just police violence, not just out there in the world, in this room, in myself? And you can't just, often when we think about diversity, equity, inclusion, initiatives, we're often targeting the group that's experiencing oppression. We're not targeting the people who have produced the oppression in the first place. I'll be fine if you get out of my way, right? So deal with whiteness, deal with maleness, deal with patriarchy, right? Deal with all that stuff. And once that's out of the way, I'll be fine. So the ways in which we frame the problem are critical here. Who is the problem? Who is the source of the problem? What is the source of the problem? Why do we even need to do this in the first place? Why doesn't it exist naturally? When you start to ask yourself those questions, it starts to lead you to whiteness, maleness, et cetera, that start in other other positionalities that are actually the root of these issues that need to be addressed directly. But too often, say, with DNI practices, what we'll do is sort of pull all the Black people together, all the people of color together, and create an affinity space for happy hour or an ice cream social or something instead of, you know, thinking more meaningfully about how to engage whiteness and white supremacy in our structures. Yeah. Do you want to add anything, Desmond? Desmond? No, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. This is so amazing. It is. All right, I'm going to keep going through the questions. We've got about 10 more minutes. Um, uh, Let's see. Thank you, Dr. Cogburn, for your excellent talk. What are your thoughts on technology even trying to address a problem at the intersection of two complex topics, mental health and racism? Yeah, I, I, I struggle with this a lot, right? In some ways, technology is, in, in many ways, these technologies are actually producing problems. So I struggle with using those same technologies to help solve some of these complex issues. But I think it really comes down to, um, again, who is using the technology, who's developing the technology, who's interrogating the ways in which we use the technologies. Um, So Desmond and I have um, created a new uh, lab here at Columbia called the Justice, Equity and Technology Lab that includes a new minor for social work students where we're asking them to understand who are mostly clinical social workers in their training. We're asking them to interrogate and understand what these technologies are, their basic technical groundings, how they're being used, how they're problematic, especially when you're centering marginalized and oppressed peoples. Um, Again, often the people who are producing and designing these technologies don't really understand humanity and society at the level that they need to in order to avoid those problems. Um, So I think we, this complex intersection, especially at the intersection of mental health, changes when you have people who practice in mental health and mental illness, people who are deeply grounded in 
work with marginalized um, communities um, to imagine how we should be best working with those communities to apply these technologies in meaningful ways or to disrupt technologies that are potentially going to cause harm. Um, so it's it's not that the technology is inherently bad, um, but we will continue to end up in bad places if we have um, groups of people designing uh, the technologies, uh, creating content for these different technologies in ways that are uh, potentially harmful. So I'll just quickly note specifically around um, extended reality, so augmented reality, virtual reality. I'm teaching a course in the spring that's uh, grounded in social work. It's for social workers, but we'll also be working with computer science students and engineering here to think about data ethics and privacy and justice, which is very different than ethics, um, clinical applications of VR, what should we do, what should we not be doing, should we be using it at all? So I think it's who's asking the questions, who's engaging the complexities of, of working in this space, and you need people from a range of disciplinary backgrounds um, in addition to other sources of diversity to help us um, avoid harm and then maximize uh, power and potential. Yeah. And I think that goes to your interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary process and that you're ensuring that you're build that we're building any systems with people who have the lived experience of mental health conditions, right? And I think one of the tenants that we have at Microsoft and especially in the AI for Accessibility program is that we're we're building, you know, it's that nothing about us without us, right? We're building with people by people, we're trying to empower people to build those technologies themselves. And as a person with lived experience in mental health, you know, I, I live with PTSD. Um, it's really important for me that I get to have control of my technology and my outcomes, that it's helping me mm -hmm. make better decisions. The technology is centered around me and my experience, and it's not for other people to kind of make those decisions for me. And I think that's really you know, that empowering people through technology is really important, especially in this space where you have that that inter that intersectionality of mental health and, and potentially racism, right? We want to make sure that people are using the technology to make good decisions. And so that it is, it's tricky. And I'm excited that on Thursday, we will be hearing from um, uh, Lee from our responsible AI office who's going to talk more about that too. Um, mm -hmm. So... Yeah, and I think just to that, just to that point, Wendy, as well, which, which is so important, like being empowered and having control and autonomy in, in the technology, in how it's being used, and how it's being used in your life, um, are, are critical. And then even that notion of for us, by us, that the us shifts, and that us exists at intersections that are important for us to, to consider at the at the outset. We're not all having the same experience with mental illnesses um, or mental illness, and we don't always have the same access for resources to deal with mental illness. We don't always have the same issues that are grounding um, the presence of, of illness. And so I think that all of those intersections are important for us to con continue to consider. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and I, like I said, we learned a lot with that call for proposals. You know, the fact that 86% of professionals in America, mental health professionals are white. You know, I think there is an opportunity for technology to help provide support, not replace any mental health professionals, and I do think we absolutely need to increase our diversity, but where can technology help connect people with peers, and mm -hmm. where can technology be culturally competent and maybe help some of the existing professionals be more culturally competent? Um, right. so there's a lot of interesting questions there. Do you want to say any more on that, or do you want me to, uh, nope. should we head to the next question? <laughs> awesome. All right. <clears throat> How might we demonstrate the com compounding health effects of racial trauma on black individuals in a similar way that helps and motivates white liberals to action? Could you repeat that? How might we demonstrate the compounding health effects of racial trauma on black individuals in a similar way that helps and motivates white liberals to action? Yeah, that's a tw tricky question for me um, because one, it sits, it it interfaces with my work in VR, right, where I'm speaking directly to white liberals. I also struggle with, especially in a mental health space, struggle with white liberals being any sort of solution um, 
to treatment and care. Um, and that's a much longer, complex conversation that would be better suited for the, the workshop. Um, but I do think something that's important to consider when we're thinking about these these accumulation of traumas is that, um, and I think Dr. Harrison is talking about this later as well, is that it's not just an accumulation in the way that I've presented in a single life. So an accumulation across context and time of a single life, it's also intergenerational. So it's been these traumas, these racial traumas have been uh, passed down through families, through through uh, you know our lineage um, in ways that are both psychological and biological. And um, again, I guess white liberal engagement of that reality um, has to kind of come, sorry um, has to come to terms with the significance of that for mental health. Um, we barely barely understand the effects of racial trauma on mental health and mental illness. We're there are so many wonderful. Um, black practic practitioners, indigenous practitioners who have been working in this space for such a long time and, you know, sort of inherently frame and think about these traumas as intergenerational. They also think about healing and coping and resilience as intergenerational. Um, so there's a piece of this, back to the first part of my response is there's a piece of this piece of this that we need to let those people hold the expertise to understand and to engage and not waste time trying to explain this to white people. But there is another piece of it is that we need more of our practitioners engaged and better trained to engage in this kind of work. Um, but uh, I sh I'm struggling because we only have so much time and so much resources. So my instinct is to say, uplift the people who are already doing this work and have been doing this work really well, who help us understand racial trauma. Acknowledge that the systems and ways in which you've been trained, the frameworks in which you've been trained to use around mental health and mental illness may be um, narrow and too limited to actually grapple with um, how this is being experienced in other communities and go to those communities for their expertise and understanding and let them do this work and then integrate it into your growth in curriculum and, and training and development over time so that you can become, become more competent in those spaces as well. Excellent. Well, that is, we are exactly on time. So this okay. is fantastic. <laughs> So I just thank you so much, Dr. Cogburn. Um, I really appreciate um, your thoughtfulness and I learned a lot and uh, we have a lot of work to do. Um, I'm hoping that we all do it together in some way.